Well, welcome to the uh, March meeting of the uh, Early Television uh, Foundation community. Um, another month has passed, <laughs> flown by actually. Um, let's start out. First of all, I want to welcome, I want to thank the um, New Jersey Antique Radio Club for sponsoring this meeting and providing the Zoom feed. We really appreciate it. And I'll let Dave say his usual bit about, about courtesy on this uh on this meeting. Yeah, just uh, please keep your microphones muted unless you're actively uh, intending to ask a question of the presenter and uh, life will, will go much more smoothly then. And other than that, I think we all know the drill by now. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, well, let me start um, talking about the two things that are going on at the, um, um, at the museum now. One obviously is the convention um, I am, I so far have 70 people who have registered or have sent me emails saying they're going to register. Um, and that's well above where we were in 2019, uh, a month or five weeks out from the show. So I think we're going to have a lot of people and we have a lot of new people uh, that have never been to the convention. Um, I urge you, if you plan to attend, Please register. Um, the more certainty we have about the numbers, I'm, I'm, you know, in, in terms of dealing with the caterers, and if we have a, a really large crowd, we may have to do something different, uh, like having lunch in two shifts or something like that. So, if you plan on attending, please um, register as soon as you can. Um, we announced our our, our presenters. Um, while back. Um, one of them is with us tonight, Bob Anderson. He's going to be giving a, a talk that is going to be um, um, different from what he's going to do at the convention, but a but a preview in a way, I guess. Um, so I would urge you, and the other president, uh, um, the other um, presentation is by, um, by Dan Jones. Um, both going to be great. We're going to have two this year to allow plenty of time for questions and for people to, you know, to explore topics thoroughly. So register if you're gonna come, tell your friends, ask them to register. Uh, second thing is the, um, the sweepstakes. Um, we have, uh, as you probably know, a TRK 120 that's in working condition that we're, that we're gonna be giving away. Um, we need to sell $10,000 in tickets to, um, uh, to award the prize. Now, if you buy tickets and we don't reach $10,000, um, you still get, you'll get 50% of whatever we take in and at the time if you're the winner. So you won't lose out. But we're at about a little under $4,000 now. Again, that's ahead of where we were last year. So get your tickets now. Um, get us up over that $10,000 number. This is a major fundraiser for the, uh, uh, for the, for the museum. Um, let me ask for anyone who is new to please introduce yourselves now if you want to. I, I am not new, but I haven't been on the call in a really long time, Steve. So hello, everybody. Good to see you. And I'll see you all at the convention. Uh, I'm Al Agofsky. Hey, Al. Good to see you. I'm uh, Neville Greeno, a uh, member of the New Jersey Antique Radio Club. And I'd certainly like to listen in. Welcome, Neville. Uh, Doug Poire, also a member of the New Jersey Antique Radio Club. And uh, this is my third or fourth meeting. Great. Glad to have you. I'm Jim McElveen. Uh, I'm new. Uh, first time. And uh wanted to check everything out a little bit because I was intending to... Uh, register for the convention. So thought I'd take a look. <laughs> Great. Paul Mondot, New Jersey Antique Radio Club. Thought I'd listen in once again. Right. Welcome. Anyone else? I'm Len. I'm a, a member of the New Jersey Antique Radio Club. First time here. Welcome. 
Well, if there's nobody else, um, let's move on to the item that um, I'm going to highlight in the museum's collection today. Um, Larry, are you, I see from your picture, you're, you're in that area. Um, today, I'm going to uh, talk about the um, um, RCA um, insurance book that we have in, at the museum. This unit has been, was in Danny Gustafson's collection. And um, um, it was, the, the whole collection went to Ed, Ed Alfonsi, who sold most of it. And he's loaned this to the museum. Um, and I haven't heard from him in several years. So it's been here for many, many years. Um, this is um, one of RCA's early prototypes for how to do color TV. And, and they, they made a number of these. They made the Ed Wright Hand did some research and they discovered 15 of them had been made. And this is one of the last ones made. It was made by RCA Labs in Princeton. RCA Labs in Princeton. Um, and it was demonstrated with uh, the FCC in February of 1960. Um, Excuse me for a second. Is, is yeah. anybody else having trouble hearing Steve? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Steve, maybe maybe try to yeah. speak a little closer I'll to your microphone. Word. Um, yeah, it's canceling you out. So try to speak closer and see if that helps. OK, does this, does this help any? We'll find out. Is that any better? Yes. I think it was just when you were turning your head, you dropped. It's directional. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's then. That's that's the problem. All right. Well, anyway, the trinoscope, um, as I said, is was a very early attempt at uh, how to do color TV, and um, it consisted of three CRTs. Um, Larry, if you go around the back side, I think we can see them. Um, two of them horizontal and one of them vertical. Um, they're standard black and white CRTs um, with a color filter in front of each one, um, the three usual colors that were used in color TV. And then there's a mirror, half silvered mirror arrangement that projects um, um, the image. There you can see part of, see one of the mirrors um, up to the uh, screen, which is uh, folds out. Um, very primitive, but um, at that time there was really no other way. They they were they were in the process of developing the the tricolor tube. They had some prototypes of various types that they tried. Um, one was a single gun tube, and then um, the other were tricolor tubes. But it wasn't until um, a couple of years later before they got um, uh, they got anything that was capable of displaying a um, um, a, a, a decent color image. And this thing probably, I, I have not seen pictures from this or photographs of pictures, but I would imagine it's capable of producing um, really nice pictures. Um, of course, it was just um, um, video input on the three channels, so there was no bandwidth limitation. Um, Uh, we had sort of hoped that the museum would acquire it at some point and we try to restore it. I think it probably could be restored fairly easily. I don't believe that there is an RCA paper on it that has the schematics and technical information. So if we could get that, and we probably have it in our library, um, we, could, um, we could probably get it going. But until um, Ed agrees to donate it to the museum, um, It'll sit here. It'll sit here idle. Um, any questions? Steve. Hello. Sorry, I was muted. I'm back. Steve, it's Mike Molnar. Hey, Mike. Hi, uh, I had read in a few places that uh, RCA only went that route, knowing they were going to do the tricolor tube, just to have something to present while CBS was presenting their version, uh, and they didn't RCA didn't have anything to put on a public display, and that's why these were developed. Uh, have you heard similar things? Yes, yes. And you think about it, I'm not sure what else they would have used. 
um, at that, you know, in 1950. No, I don't think they had anything else going. Yeah, right. Well, other than a color wheel. Steve, it's Dave here. Hi, Dave. I'm just wondering how many others still exist? You know, that I don't know. I think there's one at UCLA, um, but this may be the only other one. I didn't check our database to see, um, but I think there's only one other. And do you, do you know how Danny came into possession of these? <laughs> no. Danny was able to get just about everything um, in various ways. Um, my favorite, I think, of Danny's acquisitions was the um, Purdue University CRT set that was made in the early 30s. It was, it was a CRT receiver to be used for, um, with their mechanical transmitter. It was one of the earliest CRT receivers. And Purdue loaned it to a museum in Chicago. And somehow it ended up in Danny's collection from there. Uh, and then when he died, um, um, Ed Alfonsi inherited it and was in the process of selling it to us when um, Purdue University disputed its ownership. And um, they, nobody knew how Danny got it. Nobody could prove who owned it. And we didn't want to be involved in any kind of a controversy like that. So we just backed out and let uh, Purdue deal with with uh, with Ed um, and Purdue, he did end up getting the uh, getting getting the, getting the receiver. So I have no idea how he got it. Dave, Dave uh, I can I can tell you a story. I don't know if it's the story about that set, but I can tell you a story about a trinoscope. Um, a fella a fellow who used to be the president of the uh, New Jersey Antique Radio Club used to work at RCA Labs in Princeton, and one day they were you know. Uh, on their semi-decade cleaning out the basement and they had some junk that they wanted to get out of there. And one of the pieces of junk was a big gray cabinet with three CRTs in it, uh, which Jim Whartonby happily humped out of the basement and threw into the trunk of his car. And uh, he never did tell me who he sold it to, but he did say that it funded his antique radio collecting for probably the rest of the decade. <laughs> Well, since it was from Princeton, um, and um, this one is from Princeton, um, then um, I think there's a pretty good chance it's the same. It's the same set. I'll check with him and see if he has any more details he's willing to okay. share. All right, perfect. Any other uh, questions? What about convergence on that kind of set? I think you'd have to sit and X marks the spot to get the colors to line up. That's an interesting point. Um, the, um, it would require a very precise adjustment of the height, width, and, um, uh, and linearity and, and, and position. Um, but I would imagine it could be done. You know, they, they, they could do a pretty good precise job of scanning even in 1950. So, but you're right. It probably took quite a bit of time. I have enough trouble with one CRT, let alone three. <laughs> right. right. Well, I ran three CRT projectors in the nineties and the early two thousands. And it was always an or a lengthy ordeal to get them to sort of come close to lining up converging. And it never, it was not technically possible to ever get it perfect. And they had a thousand adjustments engineered into those things. You should have tried the Idafors. They were a dream, a bad one. Well, we used the PJ5050 uh, GEs occasionally. I never had the pleasure of using an Idafor. I think I'd be afraid of it. An Idafor is a wonderful physics project. A science project, actually, I think. It was an amazing machine. I, I took care of the ones at the Coliseum in Richfield for probably 10 years. I had one at uh, University of Michigan postgraduate medicine, and uh, 
it was just a fantastic machine. You didn't even have to dim the lights. Oh yeah, it was. Well, you got the full brightness of the xenon lamp. It was. From what they told me, there was one engineer who developed the whole thing all by himself, which is crazy. <laughs> made by Grey Tag in uh, Switzerland. Yeah. And they, they were up to a million bucks, I think, at the end of the color yeah. ones. Yeah, to be part. The whole concept seemed crazy. <laughs> yeah, to be part electronics tech and part physicist to make the thing work. Yeah, the electronics were made by Phillips. <laughs> I used to be in the concert sound business back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and a lot of arenas had Ida 4s in them, and they really did make an amazing picture. We've got one of the GE light valve projectors at the Texas Broadcast Museum. It makes an okay picture. Actually, it works, which is pretty amazing to me. Just the whole idea of you know, making a picture out of a bath of oil inside some kind of weird tube that's kind of a CRT. It's like, I wonder what they were smoking when they thought of this. It's all in the oil. <laughs> <laughs> right. And there's a story about the uh, Russians had a uh, Ida 4 and then they wanted to order a couple gallons of oil from uh, Grey Tag. <laughs> they said no. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on to our presentation tonight. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, Bob Anderson. And Bob, why don't we turn it over to you? All right. Uh, boy, my mind has been shooting in other different directions because I've never been on one of these calls before. And I'm not used to being able to interact with an audience. Um, so I thought I would talk about the past and the future and a little bit about the present. I'll start out with the present. Um, I am going to be presenting uh, at the uh, convention uh, early May. I'll be talking about my experiences um, being a YouTuber primarily. Um, uh, I don't want to get into it now, but I will we'll say this. It's had a um, pretty profound impact on my experiences in this hobby and to some extent my life, believe it or not, um, in some surprising ways. Uh, I also, uh, I've never been to the convention before. Every year something comes up that interferes. So this year I'm going to go all out. I've cleared my schedule. I'm going to get there early. Steve had asked if anybody could help out get some of the sets working, I guess. Um, I would be happy to lend my skills where and however uh, I can. And I look forward to uh, meeting everyone and having a great time. Past. Um, I think my path into this hobby is a little different than some of you and um, maybe a lot of you. I don't know. Um, by that, I mean, I was never in the industry and, and nor were any of my relatives. I never had a mentor or anything like that. Uh, it was a lot of being in the right place at the right time. Um, part of that was just being a kid in the 70s and into the 80s and living uh, near Chicago. I grew up in the suburbs. Um, uh, our suburb had uh, 50, 60,000 people. They split up garbage night over five nights. And my buddies and I would go out as much as we could, sometimes five nights a week. And there would always be electronics being thrown out, tube-based electronics. So I mean, when we were 10, 11, 12, 13, we didn't really know anything about it, but we saw this stuff, it looked cool. We'd take home what we could. We'd take the backs off of stuff. We'd poke around. Um, I got into model railroads. It's probably how I got my first exposure to electronics was I had to make the trains work and I could put the wires up. And later I was given some of those um, Radio Shack kits, little springs and wires and flip up components and, make stuff happen and uh, yeah, kind of went from there. And then uh, I was really, really lucky to go to a great high school where we had electronic shop and I got to take it for four years with the same teacher. I wouldn't quite say he was my mentor because I think I knew more than he did about some of this stuff, but I got to have an hour or so every day 
for years where I got to uh, poke around. And for the junior and senior years, you could do whatever you wanted. So I, uh, somebody mentioned radio electronics. I devoured those. And so I built a lot of the projects out of that. Uh, and that's how I picked up a lot of what I know because I didn't have anybody in my area who could mentor me is I read 73 QST and radio electronics and I built what I could no grass to make money to buy parts and uh, experiment and tinker and drag home what I could garbage picking. And that is how I found my first vintage TV. I, so we saw TV all the time. Uh, but it's funny, I was, I was thinking about this earlier today and all those nights we went out, we never actually found a, what I would call an antique TV nowadays. Nothing ever in a wood cabinet, nothing from the 40s. Uh, it was mostly 60s, 70s kind of stuff. But one man did throw out a 1948 Admiral. He smashed up the cabinet because he knew the garbage man would take it. But the chassis was just all there pristine sitting on, his, on the curb. And I took it home and I tinkered with it. Uh, I could get a raster, but I'd do nothing. And back then, no internet, I couldn't Google it. Uh, I didn't know how to find service info, so I would just poke around with it. And I had it for years and years. Um, and that was my first experience with Admiral. Uh, I went to college and all the vintage electronics stuff got packed away. My parents never really encouraged me. Um, once they discouraged me, but they weren't crazy about me dragging home all this stuff. So I kind of had to keep it uh, to a modest level. And then I went to college and ended up getting a degree in uh, electrical engineering and got um, interested in solid state electronics and microcontrollers. That was all the rage back in the early 90s. Uh, and then I moved out. I had a roommate and we were about girls and going out. And uh, for a long time, the vintage electronics stuff was just packed away in a crawl space at my parents' place. And um, it wasn't until into the 2000s when I moved out, got my own place. Uh, I kind of started looking back. I, I went to my parents' place and dug out the old boxes and old tube stuff and thought, well, you know, I've got a spare room in my apartment now. This is my place. I can do whatever I want. Let's set up a workshop. Uh, but even then, it was still mostly solid state. I built some, oh, I built a, a 10 megahertz receiver to pick up WV, I think it's called, uh, the, the time standard station. Had some fun with that. But it really wasn't until around 2007, 2008, and I was doing some free, oh, I should I skipped over something. Um, my first real job out of college was microcontroller programming um, for Rakuten, if any of you remember that company. I was in a division that made universal replacement remote controls. So it was TV related, but it was all microcontroller stuff, circuit boards, embedded controllers. Uh, it didn't pay very well. Uh, it was boring. And I started you know, teaching myself programming and I started tinkering with the old stuff in my spare time because it was more interesting to me. And eventually I completely switched over to programming for a career and went much further back in time for a hobby. So that's advice I've heard over and over again is uh, it's best to have your hobby not be your career because um, you don't want to work on something all day and then go home and expect to have fun doing it in your spare time as well. Um, so anyways, flat, flat, flashing forward uh, to around 2007, 2008, I was doing some freelance programming and I was asked to write some routine that would automatically search Craigslist. I'd heard of Craigslist. I never really went on it much or did anything. But while developing this, I was playing around with searching for things. And I'd always liked um, an Art Deco furniture um, and from watching old Three Stooges or noir films or whatever it might be. But I thought that stuff was unattainable for the average 
Joe, I thought that uh, you could go to an antique shop and pay thousands of dollars to get the real stuff, be it a Zenith radio or some cool Deco cabinet or something. Uh, so I just typed it, I think, Art Deco, Craigslist, and I saw a bunch of stuff pop up that was inexpensive and in my area. This is odd. Um, well, there was one in particular. I, I was kind of broke at the time, and that's why I was doing this freelance programming. I stumbled across an ad for somebody saying, hey, um, I need some help with my computer. Uh, if you can help me out, you're welcome to go into my basement. I've got a bunch of old Art Deco stuff. You can take whatever you want. Okay, I've got free time. I have no money. I know about computers, so sure. Uh so Crazy cold night, I think it was in January, a neighbor I'd never been to before. I went over there. Um, very eccentric woman, uh, had lived in the whole house her entire life. She was probably in her 80s, I would guess. Her husband had passed away, and she, I think, got very self indulgent with her hobbies. Uh, and her uh, home was just filled with uh, a lot of arts and crafts stuff, and it was uh, just crammed every nook and corner had something going on. But anyway, it turned out her computer problem was she had some cat hair in her mouse and I think her printer had a paper jam. And I fixed that and I said, look, you don't owe me anything. You know, it, was, it, was, it was great to meet you and see all your, your hobbies and stuff. And she said, no, no, come on, come on into the basement. You got to see what I have. It was a scary basement. Uh, everything was filthy, bad lighting. I took a quick look around and said, no, no, I'll, I'll be on my way. She said, no, there's, some, there's something I want you to see. It was a TV. She said it was her father bought. She said it was the first TV ever. And it's, he bought it new and it's been in their house for her whole life. I couldn't see it that well. I didn't recognize it. I didn't know really anything about TVs at the time. I tried to pick it up. I could barely pick it up. <laughs> I kind of wanted to get out of there at that point, at least out of the basement. So I just kind of bent my knees and took a deep breath and picked it up and carried it out, got it in my car, um, grabbed a six pack on the way home and figured, hey, you know, at least I got something to do on a Friday night. Well, then I took some photos and I hopped onto the internet and I found out there was an RCA 630TS with the original um, cable. And it was under all that filth that was in mint condition. Well, that's how all this started. Um, that's how I discovered the anti radio form and video karma. And Phil Nelson uh, was pretty instrumental because I found his website. Um, and uh, kind of the rest is history. Uh, that's how I met uh, everybody I know in the community, uh, was from going online. I, been online my whole life, well, since the early 90s anyways, um, but I never thought to search for certain things. I didn't, I didn't know there was an online community. I didn't know the stuff existed. I'd gone to ham fest and computer fest, sure, in the 80s and 90s, but I was more interested in computers and the cool new stuff and you know, ham radios and whatnot. And it's weird too, looking back, I don't think I ever saw an antique TV at all the ham fest I went to. I used to go to all of them around Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, Indiana. I was so, me and my buddy sold at a lot of them. Um, and then growing up in Chicago, where we had Admiral and Zenith and Motorola and so many others, all this stuff was under my nose for all these years. I just never saw it until I just happened to stumble across something on Craigslist. Then I started searching on Craigslist. I was like, oh, stuff everywhere. And that was another phenomenal bit of luck is, well, <laughs> for me, I mean, not for most people, is with the financial, financial crash in what, 08, is people went into their attics or their garages, their basements, and were selling stuff because they had to pay the mortgage, get the car fixed. There were TVs and radios for sale, like crazy. A lot of what I got um, was in that time period, 08, 09, 2010. And that's when I started making YouTube videos too. It just kind of became a weekly thing is I guess I'd find something during the week. I'd wait till Friday night. I'd record it, crack open a beer and edit the video and then wait for the comments to come in. 
so that's how it started. Um, now, jumping forward to the future. <laughs> so I say my mind was shooting all over the place because um, I've got a lot going on now. Uh, one, I've decided life's too short and uh, I've been focusing less on work and programming because I, when the pandemic started and I, I've been working at home for two years, um, I figured, okay, now's, now's a good time to catch up on my programming skills and catch up at work and learn some skills and stuff. And after doing that for a while, I got to thinking, I've been doing that for a long time and I've got a lot of cool projects I want to get to and I have more fun doing that. So I'm going to start focusing more attention on what I enjoy the most doing. Well, I mean, I enjoy my wife and our dogs and all that too. <laughs> uh, it's something I enjoy doing, I would say that. Um, so um, I've been remodeling the basement and down here. I'm sitting in front of a new workbench I just finished uh, a few weeks ago. And I really want to start diving back into. So there's a lot of these sets I've picked up for the last 15 years. I haven't touched them. Some of them, I got them and they went into storage and I haven't seen them in over a decade. I want to get that stuff out. I want to get back to all that stuff uh, and share it with everyone. I've also been uh, very lucky lately. I, I get the impression, uh, it's something I want to, um, I'm used to just recording my face or not my face and just showing stuff and getting it out there. And getting comments. I never get to talk to anybody in real time about other experiences. And for me, my, the golden era was around 2009, 2010. Um, I've heard other people say things were great in the 80s or in the 90s. I, I don't know. So I'm curious to hear what, what uh, your experiences have been. I know prices have, have come down, unfortunately. Uh, but something else I have in my various Craigslist adventures and now people have reached out to me is that I think there are a lot of basements like this, maybe not a lot, but at least some <laughs> where guys have um, created their man caves, their, their workshops, and they have a lifetime of amazing stuff they've assembled, not just TVs and radios, but tools and, and documentation and parts and stuff. Um, and a few weeks ago, I was contacted by somebody who said, Hey, their, their 96 year old uncle had passed away and he had one of these amazing basements and I was invited in. He said, Hey, I, I've known him before. We, we've had some other interactions. And, uh, I never got to meet his uncle, unfortunately, but he said, Hey, I like what you're doing. I know it's going to be in good hands, whatever you want, it's yours. And that also got me, it kind of re-energized me. So what, what kind of what I'm getting at here is now that this pandemic is fading away, um, I'm really energized about the future. So going to the early television foundation convention, finally setting up a new workshop and acquiring all the stuff I've got to, um, if you haven't watched any of my videos, um, I, I've been showing a little bit of it, but there's a lot I haven't yet. Some of it is all around me right now, but really good tools, really good parts, stuff made in the 30s, 40s, 50s, just things like a bench vice, but just a really, really good one, one that I couldn't afford to get, or, or, or hand tools, or drill bits, just everything that I could, basically a man's lifetime of acquiring stuff. Now I've, I was blessed to, inherited i guess you could say and i want to put it to good use um, so i want to get back to some of these more heavy duty projects now you can probably see there's predictors you can see i think two behind me there's four more in front of me and then i got six more in another room it's because uh there are very few antique tv repair guys um that will do it for you know, customers uh and apparently there's a pretty big demand for it at least for the, the eye candy, you know, people like these because they look cool. So um, I've kind of put my hat, uh, or thrown my name out there um, on various social media that, yeah. In the past, I was a little bit reluctant to. Some people I had waiting for, for several, I think the longest guy was 
over three years before I finished the set. Probably it was, I got bored with it or I can't get the right parts or I get frustrated because we've got problems. But now I'm kind of re-energized and refocused. And I want to try to divide my time between doing stuff for customers and doing my stuff. The cool sets that I've picked up over the years that some of which I've never shown it or shared with anybody. Um, but I, and I want to engage more with the community too. I, I regret not being on these meetings um, earlier and I will uh, try to continue to um, join in on these meetings and get to know you all um, better and uh, contribute what I can to the conversation. And I'd love to hear more of what you all have to say too and what, you know, learn what, what your experiences have been. Um, I've got some friends too, or at least one friend and hopefully one new friend who are interested in this kind of stuff. I want to try to get them uh, kind of more uh, energized too and engaging some younger folks. Uh, all that. I'm 53, by the way. <laughs> um, I know a few other guys in the area and it's weird. It's, it's like I, I saw, I know Al, I saw him on there, but uh, boy, things have really died down in the forums a bit. And uh, I've been kind of wondering why that is exactly. Um, and that's why, you know, why I'm curious about going to the convention too. I was glad to hear that attendance um, sounds like it's going to be pretty good. Um, as I've noticed, things have really dropped off on Craigslist. Uh, I mean, of course, you, have, you know, with the pandemic going on and stuff, but even before that, and I'm wondering, is it because things have shifted to eBay? Or has the supply really dried up? On the other hand, I know, unfortunately, collectors have passed away and there's you know, sort of a big glut of, of stuff shows up too. So I, I kind of really don't know where things are at these days in terms of interest in the hobby and supply and demand and all that. I'm positive about the future anyways. Uh, so again, I will be presenting um, this year I'm going to talk about um, how I got started uh, with YouTube, the technical challenges, how things have evolved um, with the technology over the years. And I want to talk a lot about the social impact of it, uh, of getting out there and the, the kind of people who are watching the videos and the feedback you get and how to deal with it. Uh, I think that's about it. No, I, I'm certainly uh, open to any questions you might have. Uh, I've never had an audience, live audience before with people asking questions. So if uh, anybody... the comment on your, uh, your point about shifting from different things, I think a lot of this stuff is on Facebook market now. Okay. I don't know if yeah, any other people have really seen just... that, but I find, I find a lot of the stuff on there. You just reminded me of something that uh, I'd, I'd, I thought I'd gotten over, but um, there was a Raytheon, early Raytheon color TV on Facebook Marketplace in my neighborhood. And somebody tipped me off about it. And I worked out a deal to go get it. And people were really excited because they knew that I would share it with everybody and show it. And somebody got it. It wasn't me. But he contacted me about it. And it's like, oh, by the way, I'm the guy who got that TV, just in case you were wondering. Uh, and I said, you know, I had a deal worked out. I was in my car. I was literally on the way to go get it. Uh, so I'm kind of ticked off right now. And they said, oh, well, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know. Actually, he, I think he knew that I had a deal, too. I think the seller told him, like, hey, I already made a deal. And he offered him like $50 more. I said, hey, I would have matched that. Uh, and I said, and I, anyways, long story short, it turns out the guy knew nothing about vintage TVs. He was in his early 20s. He had no idea what he was doing. Uh, he'd gotten a bonus at work and he decided that um, she just wanted it. And I said, look, uh, here's what's going to happen. Uh, nobody's ever going to see it again, and you may very well damage it. 
And he said, well, well, you can come over if you want and you can take some photos and YouTube videos and you can share it. I said, well, um, I'm a little PO'd that um, you kind of stole it up from under me. So I don't really want to do that. Uh, and he said, well, don't, don't worry, I'll take good care of it. And I'll, I'll take some photos. I'll get on the social media. And of course, he never did. And I don't know whatever happened with that set. Sometimes that stuff happens. I mean, it's just I know, you know, I know. It's unfortunate <laughs> that sometimes Facebook Marketplace can be worse than eBay. I've lost it too. I've lost. I've offered more money, and sometimes the seller wants to take a different payment method than what you say. Hey, I'll come and pay you cash, but somebody else offers them direct pay, and you don't realize they were even accepting direct pay. So it happens the best <laughs> of us. You know what I mean, sometimes just like that, it's the competitive nature of, of the unit the internet's helped sellers in a way because in the past i know some people may have had issues selling the stuff they've had but now it's like if you know what you have and you put it on there you actually have a pretty decent shot of getting close to what you want if not more especially if it's rare i know if i sure. find something rare and there's a way for me to bid on it or have highest offer i absolutely will if i want it it gets weird though because sometimes i think well if i offer him like some crazy amount of money then he's gonna think oh this is really worth a lot of money and then they just will pull the sale completely and <laughs> well you know that that cuts both ways uh if you if you get your name out there as as you have and i have to a certain extent uh you know i i had a i had a a friend in the community call me up one time and tell me about a a CBS experimental color television receiver that was for sale in New Jersey. And um, I, I looked and it was actually literally right down the road from where I was working that day. And I said, well, it's, this is the second day of a two day house sale and I'm working. I can't, I can't get there until, you know, the end of the day. So I, you know, but, but he, he said, well, if you know, if, if you want to know about it, it's over there. So I went there at the end of the day. It was still there. It was half off because it was the end of the, the second day. And we got the, uh, the, the the weird, rare CVS experimental color TV, which I had would never have seen the ad on, except that somebody out there saw the ad, called me and said, hey, you know, we figured you'd probably be interested in this. The uh, Blake, I tell you also, uh, Chuck Azalina, who's, um, you know, uh, well-known in our community. He, he told me one time his philosophy for dealing with somebody who maybe knew what they had, but, you know, we're, we're definitely interested in selling. He said he would always figure out what was a fair price, what was a price that he was willing to pay, and what was the price that the seller was, you know, should be happy to get. He was not looking to lowball anybody if it's something he really, really wanted. And he said he would go over there with cash and he would, it's a, this is an old story, an old trick, but Chuck says he used it many times. He would count out hundred dollar bills and put them in the guy's hand. And when he got to the amount that he thought it was worth, he would say, well, I'm interested in a set, but if you don't want it, you know, you can give me the money back. And everybody would look at those hundred dollar bills in their hand and nobody ever turned them down. That sounds like a, a wise salesman. <laughs> it, it worked for him, but he only bought super high end things. So I guess, and he was willing to pay, you know, hundreds or thousands if the, if the case warranted. Someone, uh, that's not me. Someone commented in the chat um, about getting younger people into the hobby because a lot of us are 50 and, and older, uh, some, some much older, some a little younger. But um, I think that's where I'm really interested to, to listen to Bob's. Uh, presentation at, at the convention because um, he's one of those people that goes that extra step where this is a very, this is a very solo hobby, right? We sit in our basements, we sit in our shops and we work with, you know, our, the electronics and, and it's, it's a very kind of solo personal kind of thing for everybody. And I think, you know, people that go that extra mile and, and take the time to video and edit and really share it with the community that's what's going to help get younger people into the hobby, right? It's out there. You can search for it. You can, you know, if you see an old TV or just if you happen to come across one of Bob's videos or, you know, the, the few other guys out there that do videos like this, that's what's really going to bring people to this, to this hobby, um, you know, and, and get people interested. So, you know, they're, they're getting Bob involved, you know, in the community and at the museum, you know, is, is really great for the, you know, for, for the hobby and for the, for the, you know, keeping this keeping this old stuff alive and keeping people interested in it so and people like blake some of the younger guys and yeah 50s old i'm 50 so <laughs> but uh but yeah it's it, it's you know it, it's it's really kind of an exciting time hopefully coming out of this pandemic we can 
you know, kind of revive the hobby a little bit. I think we're all kind of, you know, we're all really excited about this year's convention. Um, I know I am, I'm going to be there on Thursday. So looking forward to spending a lot of time at the museum. So thanks. Uh, thanks Bob for your videos. I've enjoyed them over the years. And I, I, I like you did not have anybody kind of show me the ropes. Um, Tim Poliniak got me involved in the hobby between, you know, his, his tutelage and, and watching your videos is why I can do this. So it's, you know, it's, it's great. Yeah. I think I can, I, I, I remember when you got started. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Bob, I was, I'm happy to hear that you're coming to the uh, the field day, quote unquote, at the beginning of the museum convention. Um, anybody else, too, I'm going to plug that myself. I'm going to be the one there that morning. I'm going to get a bunch of donuts. So the more people that email me or make comment that they're coming, I'll try to make sure that I accommodate for that. I also um, we have a new food truck this year. It's from a burger place called Swenson's. It's a really, really famous place in Akron. It, um a lot of Cleveland locals go will drive to Akron and they've actually come up into Akron from to Cleveland now just because they're um, they're so well known. But at any rate, they're in Columbus now, too, and they have a food truck. Um, there's a it's a it's a really it's kind of neat because it's kind of in theme. It's like an old 50s car hop type of menu burger place with shakes and um, they're bringing the food truck to the museum. So the more people that come, it'll be good because uh, it's it, I tried to get guarantee them as many as I could. So, but I, I'm glad to hear that people are coming and I think we're going to have a really good time, especially in that evening. So uh, don't necessarily plan to get a restaurant. I think you'd be really pleasantly surprised with the food truck. Cause it's really top notch stuff. It's not low quality at all. Yeah, Blake, I'm going to be another one of those people coming to help out on Friday, as you probably know, but uh, the one quick comment I wanted to make, I, I think too, there's still quite a bit of luck finding stuff because uh, some of you know, you know, I have a day job, but I also help out the local uh, TV and radio repair shop. And we're the only one in the area that will service antique electronics. Unfortunately, we don't service televisions anymore because there's just, there's no money in it anymore. So we quick completely dropped the TV part, but a lot of people still call and say, Hey, I got an old TV. Do you know anyone that would want it? Or we've had people just drop off boxes of tubes and stuff. And, um, you know, I've got an agreement with the owner. He'll take all the audio tubes and stuff that he needs. And then whatever TV tubes he has left over, he just gives them to me. So, um, you know, the stuff is still out there. In fact, just today I was over there and one of the other texts says, Hey, did you see this new Admiral that came in? no i haven't and it had a tv in one side i think al Hagofsky did one similar to it see admiral it's got the record player on one side and it's got the tv in the other and he says yeah and the guy wants to wants us to rip the tv out I'm like why <laughs> so we said yeah we could probably fix that i mean admirals were pretty solid sets and that and so we put it on the sencore and turned up the voltage and hey it gets a raster so yeah. So we're going to try and hopefully talk the guy down from the ledge and get him to restore it instead. Cause you know, you can hook a VCR up to it and still use it. Uh, this is Nev Greeno. I, I really, Bob, I really enjoy your videos. Uh, frankly, I'm in awe of your ability to service and edit and, uh, and, and do these things. And it looks so focused. Uh, you zero right in on the issues and deal with it. But I really and like to ask the behind the curtain question, how much of that is in the editing and how much ends up on the cutting room floor? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good question. I've gotten better over the years, but yeah, of course you only see what I decide you're going to see. <laughs> um, I will say this though. I've never really screwed anything up. I've never dropped a picture tube or uh, uh, I think I've gotten everything to work that I ever started restoring. I don't think I've ever given up on anything. That being said, though, I kind of I choose what I'm going to work on. You know, I decide that I'm going to make it work. You know, I already kind of know what condition something is in. Uh, but yeah, uh, how much ends up on the editor? Probably at least half. It used to probably be about 75% of what I recorded got thrown away. Uh, I've never really done a blooper reel, but oh my. Uh, I've had to re-record something maybe 20 times because I keep stumbling over a word or saying the wrong. I mean, you know, just like you see another blooper reel. I do that too. <laughs> 
And uh, it is a, that's why I would sometimes have a beer before I started editing a video because <laughs> it could be an ordeal to have to hear yourself making a mistake over and over. <laughs> well, hey, Bob, you can take that as a pretty high praise because I'll embarrass uh, Neville here and say he didn't introduce himself too much. But if you Google his pedigree, he's, um, he's, he's not a dope. <laughs> He's an interesting guy. <laughs> hey, uh, Bob. Uh, anyway. Bob, I was, uh, I don't know if you hear me or not, yep. but uh, yeah, uh, talking about community. I think we're, I'm, I'm not seeing myself on here, but anyway, talking about community. We, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, um, I know a uh, TV repair guy who makes the uh, networks, the couplets for uh, oh, yeah. predictors and stuff like that. Matter of fact, he's pretty busy uh, working on some predictors of his own, as a matter of fact. Uh, so you've got some competition down here in Texas. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's good because um, I, I don't like... Um, I discourage people from shipping them. So I'm in the sure. Midwest. So I generally, I only work on stuff in the Midwest. So right. the more right. the better. And I've um, been to, I've, I've been to the convention probably about three times already. I'm not going to make it this, this year, unfortunately, uh, next year is what my plans are, but, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. I'm going to miss you this year. <laughs> I, I'll anyway, try I to go every year from I now watch, on. I'll watch it. Yeah, I watch your videos uh, a lot. Oh. I was just matter of fact, I was just lo looking at your your latest one. I didn't get. I only got about halfway through it, but I was just looking at your your, your latest one before I got to this meeting. As a matter of fact, I really like your background there, incidentally. Yeah, I took that at your museum uh, years ago, and uh, you know, looking around for a background that was related to uh, TVs and such. It's one that was kind of colorful. So, I've already had a lot of people. Uh, Messaging me and say, "Is that your? Is that your cameras?" <laughs> I said, "No, <laughs> I don't have any cameras." As a matter of fact, uh, but it was just a nice background there. Hey, if you but, don't have uh, any cameras, I know we could fix you up. <laughs> <laughs> We've well, got lots anyway. of them. That we don't know what to do with. Uh, well, it's an interesting problem to have, I guess. Quick question. Um, I recognize the two on the ends. Is that a GE or a Sarkis and the, um, behind your head? The GE. If, if, if you're talking about the picture that was just up with Tim there. Is it, are you talking about, uh, yeah, you're talking about my uh, pictures back here? The, the one that says KRLD. That's a very famous camera, actually. That uh, is a GE. Uh, it was actually, I, I worked at KRLD when I was in college in the news department. That thing was there when Lee Harvey Oswald was shot. Uh, it's been at the museum in Washington, D.C. for the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. And it's also spent a year at the uh, uh, Sixth Floor Museum in Dallas, which is the Kennedy Assassination Museum. Get back to Bob. Bob, this is Richard Lee again. Uh, obviously, you're talking about your proficiency in electronics and restoration TVs and radios. Some of your earlier videos um, I've, I've looked at and really were impressed by is your proficiency also in cabinet restoration. And you are a perfectionist. <laughs> and I remember one, uh, one episode in particular where you're talking about fisheye in, in, a, in a finish. And I believe it was a, a blush having to do with uh, shellac. And there was just a little area that you saw fisheye. Nobody else did, by the way, Bob, but you did. And uh, I said, oh, that's it. Got to strip the cabinet again, do it over again. So uh, you are amazing when it comes to that, too. Thanks. I think I know that cabinet you're referring to, and I refinished it three times. <laughs> and I sold it to somebody who's not my best friend. So <laughs> that worked out well. Uh, I have not done any refinishing, not, not major since we moved. 
but uh, some other long overdue thing is uh, I want to take half the garage and make it into a refinishing area to do some of the larger cabinets. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> that's a challenge. Hey, I, Bob, I got, I got a question. Um, you, you say you're setting up your new workbench. Um, I'm setting up a, a new workbench now because we just moved and I've, I haven't really had a proper workbench set up in, in years uh, through the last two moves, actually. And I'm really looking forward to getting it set up just right here. And I, I've never really figured out if there's a best way to have it arranged. I've always had, you know, my meters and my oscilloscopes and whatever. But I'm just curious if, if, uh, if and you or anybody else on the call here actually has thought this through, you know, and what's, what's a good spot? I mean, do you stack everything up on the wall or do you keep it movable on the bench? I've done it both ways and it always seems to be the way it happened as opposed to maybe the best way it could have been planned. Well, I can tell you what I, what I have decided to do is I left the workbench bare and just started working on projects. And as I'm meeting things, I just grab them and start putting them where they seem they should naturally go. And I figure after a couple months of that, I'll kind of feel out where things should be. Uh, I don't know if that's going to work out, <laughs> but that's how it has been so far. That's actually really good advice. But one thing I would recommend is make the bench deeper than you think you need it. Because for some reason, all the stuff that you've got, the test equipment and stuff, takes up a whole bunch of the bench. And all of a sudden, you find you've got 18 inches with this giant TV on. And that doesn't work out real well. That's great yeah. advice. Chuck, That's Chuck, great advice, matter. Chuck. And, Chuck, and it doesn't Dave. matter if it's six foot uh, deep. It's, you're still going to throw it up. Yeah. That's no. great yeah. advice. And Dave, too, you're going to find it's an iterative thing. Huh. You're going to get it set up. And then after a while, you might obtain other pieces of test equipment or uh you know just depending on what your needs are you may be reorganizing it or re yeah. relaying well, it out I, i've That's, been iterating for for decades now yeah I've, I've, I've been iterating and frittering around for decades and it it always seems to migrate and move but I, the way what i've kind of settled on is i keep two sets of shelves behind the workbench and that holds all the smaller meters and power supplies and things and then the biggest big oscilloscope obviously goes on the bench or on a on a cart and of course, the biggest oscilloscope is about this big now, but uh, yeah, um, <laughs> it just Cart seemed to be the way that it, it fell into place for me. But carts uh, are great. Always looking for other opinions. Yeah, you know I haven't uh, got a workbench set up, but uh, this just triggered a few brain cells about how we worked in the lab at Zenith. And uh, the, uh, typically, the workbench was full of test equipment and the project was on a rolling cart. And, and that seemed to work out well. Yeah, w Wayne is absolutely correct. If you can find some old AV carts like you used to wheel into classrooms with a 16 millimeter projector, you can find those things cheap. There's a surplus store near us. We've got about 30 or 40 of the things. They've sold them to us for like 20 bucks a piece. They are the greatest thing since sliced bread because you get into a project where everything's going fine and all of a sudden you get to a stopping point and you just can't go any further because you don't have the parts or, or whatever. Uh, you have this thing on this cart, you can wheel it out of the way and you can go on to the next project. They really, really help. Uh, highly recommend carts because remember, nature abhors a vacuum. Just always remember that. So if you've got space, something's going to fill it up. <laughs> yeah, Dave, and I think part of it too is you'll notice that the stuff you use the most is what you're going to want to have right by you because I, like you, have got a couple of shelves with all the small meters and things. And I mean, for a while, I was kind of a test equipment junkie. I was collecting the stuff and rebuilding it and that. And then it's like, no, I don't need half this stuff. And uh, <laughs> Tim Poliniak was visiting my house one time. And so I'm showing him my basement shop and everything. And he takes a look. He says, so how much of that stuff do you actually use? <laughs> so I said, maybe 10% mm -hmm. of it regularly. But now and then I'll need right. something. And even I have to admit that I certainly don't end up needing two or three or four of everything, which is what I seem to have accumulated. Oh, it's spare parts. Mm. 
<laughs> That's the justification I use. Need is such a nebulous concept, you know. <laughs> you need more. <laughs> Well, I convinced myself that I needed a spectrum analyzer when I ran across one one time. And then I realized I didn't have any earthly use for it in anything that I did. But I found a friend who needed one and traded me an Atwater Kent breadboard for it. So it worked out well. Hey, don't feel too bad. I got one too. But frankly, a Simpson <laughs> 260 voltmeter is your best friend. That and a soldering iron and a set of X-Lite uh, uh, nut drivers. A pair of dikes and some needle nose. That's about it. Well, I don't know. Well, let's ask Bob again. He's our uh, featured speaker here. I'm an oscilloscope guy. I, I always tell people, if I can see what's going on in there, I can usually, even, even I can figure out what the hell is going on. If I have to rely on my training, which I have none, I'm in pretty deep trouble most of the time. Well, a, a, a scope and a tube good tube tester are also really handy to have, especially a mm. CRT tester these days. Yeah. Bob, what do you what do you use most often? Oh, Bob's not there. Bob's invisible. No, I'm getting what, what I use most. <laughs> uh, Kilroy was here. Bob was on the floor. <laughs> I'm on the floor because I cleared off by this the desk to uh, set the laptop up to do this presentation. Uh, hey, Dave. Dave, remind. Um, well, I'm reminding you to remind mm -hmm. Bob what uh, oscilloscope you picked up a few years ago on eBay and the reason you got it. You're talking to me? Yeah. Uh, I may have an oscilloscope, but apparently I don't have any brain cells working right now. Which oscilloscope did I pick up on eBay? You told me you saw it on Bob's bench. Oh, I bought, a, I bought that uh, HP, uh, that semi-digital oh. scope that you were, uh, <laughs> you were very fond of uh, a while back. Yeah, I'm not as fond of it anymore, but uh, yes. Well, I've, I've <laughs> since upgraded to one of the $300 Chinese scopes, but I was absolutely um, seduced by the idea of being able to do cursor measurements of uh, voltage yeah. and frequency on the screen, which my, my 500 pound tectronic scopes cannot do. We're talking about an HP 54600D with that series. <laughs> Yep, which is what I used in college, and it's it's got a button. You just push it, and it generally gives you what you want. <laughs> I love it. I abs and it's absolutely absolutely love it. Yep, yeah, However, I got that from you a long time ago. Cool. Uh, recently, yeah. I was given a Tektronix five forty five, I think, which has phenomenal analog bandwidth. 300 megahertz or something crazy like that and I, I put some video signals into that thing and i'm like oh now i see what people are talking about and it's just beautiful it's got a lot of problems but it works well enough that i can use uh, but anyways you asked about tools this is like 95 percent of what i need <laughs> needle nose little nippers these are from arts and crafts jewelry and then that quarter inch nut driver so like I'm working on uh, six predictors simultaneously right now. This is this and a good soldering, uh, temperature controlled soldering iron and a roll of solder. That's pretty much all I've been using. And you got your wire wrap tool too. I do now, yeah. You gotta have one for predictor. I didn't for a long time. I just used the needle nose and now I feel like an idiot because yes, <laughs> that tool, uh, I've, been, I've been using it to wrap a little bit too when I can. Um, Put me off as, put me off as the price of those darn things. I mean, if you're buying them new, like from Mauser and that, I thought, yeah, well, really this much for this little tool, but it's more than paid for itself. This is the one I'm using now. I think it was 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can, un it does both uh, wrapping and unwrapping. It does 22 to 26 gauge or something like that. It's not perfect, but it's, it's good enough. Looks a lot better than anything else. I've used, so. Dave, Dave, you're not the only one that's bought equipment that you've seen in <laughs> Bob's videos. I think my Fluke multimeter, my Variac, my CRT tester, <laughs> my capacitor tester, I think all of those I hunted down after seeing Bob do cool videos on them. Oh, there's a yeah. ripple effect. I've well, the yeah. price goes yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, you know what they say, Al, you don't learn from others' mistakes because you won't live, you won't ever live long enough to make them all yourself. That's right. 
I gotta say too, I mean, I didn't invent this stuff. I mean, I didn't discover a lot of the stuff I show you. It's I got it from other people, so I'm just passing it along. Uh, like old 64 goat. I mean, I was watching him 15 years ago, uh, and it's been cool to uh, and some of the stuff that like he had in his old workshop took me a long time to find, like his pyramid CRA one capacitor analyzer. Those things are hard to find. I, yeah, I got <laughs> one of those. Yep. Did you? Yeah. Or the the uh, the Midwest uh, cathode ray beamer that I recently got. A long time. To oh, you got. Those. Oh, you've got a Midwest. You don't have the. Uh, no, um, I got. <laughs> I didn't get the Raytronics. Um, I got the, the, the earlier one. The Raytronics. I got a Raytronics. <laughs> new, new in the box. Uh, how to get it. Wow. wow. <laughs> uh, I have not turned it on. It's kind of terrifying inside. There are no safety <laughs> <laughs> features in it whatsoever. Uh, but it's a neat thing to have. I don't know if we'll ever actually use it. Uh, but it's an interesting device. I mean, it's, uh, I'm just going to echo a lot of what you guys have just said. I used to collect a lot of test equipment. I still do now and then. I don't use the vast majority of it. A lot of it I just buy because it's eye candy or because I could, but I don't use most of it. Uh, there's one good solid tube tester, one good oscilloscope. If I had to put my money into something, a, a good soldering iron, uh, and a good pair of needle nose pliers served you very well a scope yeah i've got a couple of scopes i don't i don't use them very, very often oh and then yeah it's nice to see what's going on see the local oscillators running or something like that and i just acquired a whole mess of <laughs> i have three titronic scopes out in the garage it's 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 nuts um I'll probably end up giving most of it away to be honest i'm thinking they did raffle it off or something or trade it i don't know uh, a lot of it's in beautiful condition, but I just don't know. I was surprised. I recently, so I'd always heard about Hewlett Packard. They're the first uh, um, first piece of equipment. They're their, uh, their audio generator. Uh, what a fantastic thing it was, or what an innovative design at the time it was. I finally got one, uh, and I was shocked at how heavy the thing is and how big it is. I think it all has all of three tubes inside of it. <laughs> it doesn't do a whole lot. I'm glad to have it. I'll play around with it, but will I ever use it for anything? Probably not. <laughs> three tubes and a light bulb. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy I got it from, I think he was using it for a doorbell or something. <laughs> I read somewhere that one of HP's first big customers for those was Walt Disney for making the sound effects in Fantasia. I don't know <laughs> if that's true or not, but story <laughs> uh, they made the things for decades i think something like that slight improvements yeah all all, all hp equipment is very, very heavy it, that's that's something you can <laughs> bet on it's got uh, very good uh, characteristics and everything it puts out really i mean that for that oscillator for instance it's very low distortion mm -hmm. it has a auto uh, you know levels the, the signal strength and stuff like that so for its time it was uh, uh, something really nice. But yeah, all that equipment, all HP stuff is a lot heavier than anybody else. But it, it doesn't make necessarily mean, it, mean it's more durable uh, unless you, you count uh, not being able to be dented so easily because it's got a really good uh, chassis, hard, you know, in the cabinet and stuff on them. Yeah. HP stuff too is at least from the few pieces that I've had over the years. It's it's a it's nice to service. They had serviceability in mind for those. Like all the circuit boards, it's like you know you turn a doorknob and they they swing out, and all the traces, the major traces are labeled. The test points are all labeled, and that it's very easy to navigate your way through one of those devices. And Tektronix is almost as good in that mm -hmm. area too. Yeah. Tektronics are just a work of art inside the old yeah. ones. You know, we here used to say that the saddest engineers was uh, an HP engineer that had to use an HP scope or a Tektronics engineer that had to use a Tektronics spectrum analyzer. Tell you one cool thing is I, I saw a buddy over who uh, had been in the army and a lot of the stuff equipment I got was um, 
military equipment and he was impressed with how heavy it was and how complicated the dials were and whatnot. Then we looked inside some of the stuff and he was shocked at how few active components there were. And he, he, but he, he realized the beauty of it, the mechanical engineering that went into it. We have, I have a couple of Collins receivers and we were looking at those. But back then, they so used to talk about low distortion or, or uh, you know, accurate dial tracking. It was beautiful engineering. Nowadays, everything is fixed with software. If there's a distortion or errors or nonlinearity, you just compensate for it with programming. Back then, you actually had to physically solve the problem, compensate. You use a cam or something to make it look, to get a nonlinear, make a nonlinear action linear, or use a nonlinear meter. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the appeals to me is like having a TV work that has a dozen tubes in it versus a 10 million transistors. It's, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> Um, this is Steve. Um, I really appreciate your talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to have to go. So um, thanks again, and we'll see you at the, at the convention. Huh? Okay. Well, as Steve. usual, we can, you, Steve. <laughs> we can we can stay on and yak. Uh, we, I guess we can end the uh, formal portion of the meeting here, but uh, if anybody wants to stay on, we'll, uh, I guess we'll stop the recording and uh, you can hang in as late as you like. Well, Bob, I'm looking forward to sharing the stage with you at the uh, convention. So I think it'll be fun. Likewise. I'm sure, we'll be Look forward to it. I'm going to go. It's almost bedtime or I'm going to go down into my shop and tinker. <laughs> so, but it's good seeing everybody and I'll see everybody at the convention in May. Looking forward to it this year.